And so, Father God, we thank you so much for this opportunity. We thank you uh, for uh, the fact that we get to open up your word uh, and to do so publicly. We get to gather like this and worship you uh, freely. Uh, and so help us to do it in such a way that is pleasing to you, that honors you. Uh, Father, I pray now that uh, as we jump into your word, that our hearts would be open, uh, that we would see you for who you are, and that we might be able to respond to it. The gospel demands a response. And so we want to respond to you in a right way. God, we love you. We praise you. We give you all the glory. In Jesus' beautiful name we pray. Amen. We've sung about it. Now we're going to talk about it. Jesus as our high priest. We've mentioned this before in our series in the book of Hebrews. If you've been tracking with us, you'd remember all the way back to Hebrews chapter 1, that we introduced Jesus as our high priest. Uh, We saw in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3, it said, after making purification for sins, he sat down at the right hand of the majesty on high. By way of recap, we said this, the purifying of sins is no small thing. It's a cosmic thing. Work to declare people who were once unclean clean is massive. It is no small thing. To forgive sins, this this is a a God thing. And God did it. He did it through the death and resurrection of his son, Jesus. Jesus' body was broken for you and me. Every single drop was shed. For those who surrender their lives to Jesus as Lord and Savior, that they are covered by his blood. This blood saves. This blood forgives. This blood heals. This blood restores. This blood reconciles. Until this very day, this blood still works. We went on to say that the overarching significance of Hebrews chapter 1 verse 3 is that priests who until Jesus did this purifying work, we also saw that these priests never sat down. Levitical priests were always standing, 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 because the sacrifice that they did was never complete. But Jesus, oh, but Jesus, the high priest, he sat down. See, day after day, every priest would stand and perform his religious duties again and again. He offers the same sacrifice, which can never really take away sins. It was was more a, a symbol of what was to come. But when Jesus came, and finished what he had come to do, he sat down. He sat down at the right hand of God. See, on the cross, Jesus shouted, it is finished. And then he confirmed it by taking his seat forever. See, for the purposes of where the author of Hebrews is now about to take us, I have to, I have to build a little bit more on this role of the high priest. We, we, we have to understand it because where he's going, this is crucial for us to know. See, the role of the high priest in the Old Testament could not be taken up by just anyone. There were no self-appointments like we have today. And there is a lot of self-appointments today. Apostle this and prophet that. That's not how it worked. See, firstly, you you had to be a member of the tribe of Levi. But not everyone in the tribe qualified. You you had to be a descendant of the family of Aaron. See, Aaron was Moses' brother. And and, and even that, only one of the descendants of Aaron was given the privilege of serving as the high priest. One at a time. The the high priest, give a little bit more, the high priest wore a breastplate with the names of all 12 tribes of Israel. This was to communicate that he was to represent everyone, all people. He alone would enter the Holy of Holies on one day 
of the year. That day was called the Day of Atonement. And on that day, he would offer sacrifices for the sins of the people, allowing a, a continual relationship with God. This was the role of the high priest. It says in Hebrews chapter 5, verse 1, for every high priest taken from among men is appointed in matters pertaining to God for the people to offer both gifts and sacrifices for sins. He is able to deal gently with those who are ignorant and are going astray since he is also clothed with weakness. Because of this, he must make an offering for his own sins as well as for the people. No one takes this honor on himself. Instead, a person is called by God just as Aaron was. Yeah. You see, the high priest was chosen to, to be the in-betweener, yeah. for lack of better words. The one who, who, who stood in the gap he represented uh, the people to God and then God to the people. Yeah. What the author of Hebrews is about to unpack for us is that Jesus Christ is the ultimate in-betweener. The one who stands in the gap created by our sin. The, the gap that separated us from God. See, through his sinless life, sacrificial death, bodily resurrection, and his current ministry of interceding for us at God's right hand. He, he has made a way for us to get to God. This is the role of the high priest. See, the high priest had an important position in the minds of the Jewish people. It was no small thing. I think sometimes we just read over it very, very quickly. But it was no small thing for the Jewish people. There was a, a, a mysterious aura that surrounded the high priest. His garments were, were made with threads of gold and the breastplate he wore was covered with precious jewels such as emeralds and sapphires and diamonds. There was a, a sacred and glorious atmosphere surrounding the high priest and his ministry. This is important for us to know. However, however, having said all of this, there were major issues in the system of the high priest. One of them was that the high priest himself was a sinner. Yeah. Hebrews chapter 5, verse 3 points to this. The, the high priest himself also needed a high priest. Yeah. That's issue number one. Issue number two that we need to bring up is that the high priest could only offer a sacrifice for sins with the blood of bulls, goats, and lambs. Uh, Hebrews 10 says this. Let me read you the first four verses. It says, The old system under the law of Moses was only a shadow, a dim preview of the good things to come, not the good things themselves. Yeah. The sacrifices under that system were repeated again and again, year after year, but they were never able to provide perfect cleansing for those who came to worship. If they could have provided the perfect cleansing, the sacrifices would have stopped for the worshipers would have been purified once for all time and their feelings of guilt would have disappeared. But, but hear this. But instead, those sacrifices actually reminded them of their sins year after year. For it is not possible for the blood of bulls and goats to take away sins. So there was an issue. So here is the conundrum that all of this requires us to ask and answer if we are to move forward. If the Old Testament high priest and the animal sacrifices he offered could never fully and finally take away the penalty of sin, what hope do we have of ever getting to God? Yeah. The answer is we need a high priest who is fully qualified to serve in that role and he is himself sinless and is able to offer a sacrifice for our sins that is perfect and faultless and has the ability of forever and finally wiping away the penalty for our sins. We're still in doctrine. Stay with me. I can see your eyes are like, oh, but this is quite a bit of information. on it. Why do we need to know this? It's massively important for us to know this. Yeah. Right thoughts about God lead to a right response to God. Yeah. Yeah. So 
So who could be this high priest? What sort of sacrifice must he offer? The answer is, spoiler alert. If you've been coming to Rooted for a while, we say it every week. The answer is Jesus. Amen. The answer is, Amen. is Jesus. Jesus is the sacrifice. His own blood was the payment by which the penalty for our sins is cleansed. It's what we call propitiation. We covered this in our series, We Are All Theologians. Propitiation. You might go, oh, I know, big word. What does that mean? A price that satisfies. A price that satisfies. Propitiation. What the author of Hebrews is saying in Hebrews 4, verse 14, all the way into 5, verse 10, is kind of like the, the introduction to his dissertation. That's, that's why this is important. This is the introduction to his dissertation. And this goes all the way to Hebrews chapter 10. That's why if we don't understand this, if we don't anchor ourselves in this, then as we continue, none of this is going to make any sense. It's going to go over our heads. It's going to go, oh, okay, yeah, I know, yeah, I know, yeah, I know. No, 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 you don't. Jesus is the ultimate high priest. Yeah, amen. He is our amen. ultimate high priest. Without him, there was no way for us to get to the Father. Yeah. Yeah. Earthly high priest after earthly high priest after earthly high priest. Year after year after year. They, they, they were longing, they were longing for that, that, that beautiful intimacy with the Father. And then when Jesus came, accomplished what he accomplished on the cross. It allowed us to enter into a relationship with God the Father. Now we must ask this question, is Jesus qualified to carry this role? And I want us to, to, to ask this question and answer it because again, I don't want us just to be like, oh, yes, he is. How do you know? If someone was to ask you that question, what, what response would you give? Is he qualified for this role? In fact, I, I believe that the, 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 the audience, that the, the writer of Hebrews, like as he's, this is being communicated to them, they're probably going, okay, hold on. High, high priest is no small thing. And so this Jesus, is he qualified? Yeah. Let's take a, a look at a few qualifications required for the role of a high priest. And then as we do that, I want to show you that not, not only was Jesus qualified, he summa cum laude, the whole thing. Yes, amen. The whole thing. Amen. Number one, a high priest must be, as Hebrews 5 verse 1 tells us, he must be taken from among men. Which tells us that he must be human. See, an angel or animal cannot represent us before God. We, we are the ones who sinned. We are the ones who created this dividing wall of hostility between us and God. Therefore, one of us, one of us must serve as the in-betweener. Remembering that Jesus, fully God and fully man. We covered this a couple of weeks ago. Fully God and fully man. So he qualifies. Number two, a high priest must be able to sympathize with those whom he represents and must be able to, as the text tells us, deal gently with those who are ignorant and are going astray. Jesus fulfills this perfectly. Hebrews chapter 2 verse 18 says this, For since he himself has suffered when he was tempted, he is able to help those who are tempted. He's been where you are. He, Hebrews chapter 4 verse 15 says, For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in every way as we are, yet without sin. Hallelujah. He's been where you are. The, the ancient word translated sympathize literally means to suffer along with. To suffer 
along with. He suffers along with, but does not sin. He's been where you are. Jesus can sympathize with our weaknesses and our temptation, but he cannot sympathize with our sin. There is a line that he does not cross, and yet many of us, we cross it. Let's be honest. We we wrestle, we wrestle the the temptation of sin. We we, we struggle, and, and then we give in. And Jesus goes, I've been there. Ever felt abandoned? Jesus was abandoned. Ever felt like people are just lying about you and your character? Jesus has been there. He's been tempted just like us, but he did not give in to sin. And so he's able to understand. He gets it. He's like, no, I understand, I understand. But I did not cross that line. Jesus, he qualifies, rightly qualifies to be the high priest because he is fully man while still being fully God, and he's able to sympathize with us, with our humanity. This is why, and I, I get it all the time. People always ask me, Ane, why is Batman your favorite superhero? Right, like of, like of all superheroes, why Batman? I, I've, got a, I've got a list, I've got a whole list. Uh, one of them is because he's self-righteous. If you think about it, he is, right? He's self-righteous and I've got a little bit of that. Okay, no, I've got a lot of that. But the other reason that I love Batman is because he's human. He's human and so like when, I, when I'm watching, and I know it's fictional, I know, just come with me. Like, like w- 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 when I see him taking the punches, I go, yeah, yeah. He gets it. Like when he goes down, I'm like, yeah, I'll also go down. But then he gets back up and I'm like, well, so I can get up. He needs to train. He needs to stay in shape. I need to train. He needs to eat well. I don't know if he was a vegan, but that's debatable. <laughs> Massively debatable. But like, like Superman, like when he takes a knock, I'm going, oh, he took a knock, but I don't know if he felt it. Like maybe, you know what I mean? Like you know when you're being pushed, but you don't, I don't know. I don't know. But Batman, yeah. 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 Jesus knows. Yeah. And you guys need to understand that. Yes, we worship him because he's fully God, yeah. but we can come to him because he's fully man. Now, having said all of this, make no mistake, make no mistake, friends, Jesus is the high priest because, yes, he qualifies according to, like, the qualifications of what it meant to be a high priest and what we see in Leviticus. But but make no mistake, Jesus qualifies as the high priest because he he divinely qualifies. He was divinely chosen. So even if we didn't have Leviticus, he would still be the high priest. And so I, I, I give you the, 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 the human stuff, right? Like, I'm like, okay, let me, let me show you. Yes, he does qualify, yes. But still, even if we didn't have that, he still qualifies. Yeah. He is still our high priest. It says in verse 5, in the same way, Christ did not exalt himself to become a high priest, but God who said to him, you are my son. Today I have become your father. Not only was Christ divinely chosen, but he was chosen for two particular offices. The ultimate royal office and the ultimate priestly office. Again, this needs to be clear in our minds if we're going to make it all the way to Hebrews chapter 10. The writer of Hebrews is going to unpack some stuff, and if we are not anchored in this reality, in this truth, then it's not going to make sense to us the ultimate royal office, and the ultimate priestly office. And all of this is declared. It's it's made known to us in the Old Testament. His royal office was prophesied in Psalm 2 verse 7. It says, I will declare the Lord's decree. He said to me, you are my son. Today I have become your father. This points to Christ as both Lord and Christ, right? He's both Lord and he's the Messiah, Peter declares this in his sermon in Acts chapter 2, verse 36, when he says, So let everyone in Israel know for certain that God has made this 
Jesus, whom you crucified, to be both Lord and Messiah. This is telling us that Jesus is the eternal king. He is the eternal king. Also, says in another place, verse 6, you are a priest forever, according to the order of Melchizedek. You see, Jesus' priestly office was prophesied as well. The author of Hebrews points to this by quoting a Psalm 110, verse 4, where it says, the Lord has sworn an oath and will not take it back. Think about that for a moment. The, the Lord has sworn an oath and will not take it back. You are a priest forever, according to the pattern of Melchizedek. Now, this, this would have been a shocking statement to the original audience. To us, it's like, okay, you know, who's Melchizedek? Why is he so important? Why does this matter? But to the original audience, they would have gone, you know, author of uh, Hebrews, the writer of Hebrews, just hold on a little bit. We've been tracking with you for a while, but now, you, now you're going a little bit too far. R- remember in the introduction, I said, I said the, 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 the author of Hebrews, it's like what he does, you read the gospels, you read the letters, it is clear Jesus is king and he is prophet. But, but very little mention of Jesus as the priest. Like we can, we, can, we can allude to it in, in the, the John 17 where he prays, right? We can, okay, we can make that connection. But even there, it's not like clear. But, but the writer of Hebrews, he makes it very clear. Very clear. And so I, the original audience is going, okay, I hear you. I'll track with you. I'm uncomfortable. Then he gets to this and it's like, stop. Where do you get that from? Why would you even say that? What the the author of Hebrews is doing is he's identifying Jesus with the mysterious priesthood of Melchizedek. And not only that, not only that, but but Psalm 110 verse 4 now becomes the theme text of the heart of the letter of Hebrews. Psalm 110 verse 4 is quoted three times in the book of Hebrews. And then an additional eight references are made. So this Psalm, Psalm 110 verse, it it matters. It's important here to realize that Melchizedek, according to Genesis 14, was both the king of Salem and the priest of God most high. They would have known that. They would have known that. They would have gone, no, 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 this, this Melchizedek is no small thing. He, he, he was the king of Salem and the priest of God most high. Yeah. Uh, let, let, let me unpack a little bit about who Melchizedek is. The name Melchizedek is, is a, a compound of two Hebrew words. Melech is the Hebrew word for king, and Zadok means righteousness. So Melchizedek was literally the king of righteousness. If you've been walking with Jesus for a while, I hope alarm bells are ringing. Melchizedek was the king of righteousness. Like I said, Melchizedek was the king of Salem. And many theologians, of which I agree with them, believe that, that Salem was, was the ancient Jerusalem. So he was the king of Jerusalem. Jerusalem's a big deal. Here's another interesting truth. Nothing is said about Melchizedek's parents, his ancestry, his descendants, his birth, or his death. There's no mention of that. He reigns as priest and king without beginning or end. I I really really hope you guys are starting to connect the dots. I I really hope so. I wouldn't have to preach as long if you are. Hebrews chapter 7 verse 3 says this, there is no record of his father or mother or any of his ancestors, no beginning or end to his life. He remains a priest forever, resembling the son of God. Guys, I want you to know what is, what is normal to us, this was brand new. 
to that original audience. Melchizedek is not mentioned again in the rest of Genesis. So we see him once in Genesis 14. And then his name comes up again in Psalm 110, which is then quoted here, which sets the tone for the rest of Hebrews. And then, like, nowhere else in the Old Testament. He literally disappears. The, the kingship of Israel can be traced back to David. The priesthood of Israel can be traced back to Aaron and the tribe of Levi. And Melchizedek preceded both of them. Oh, I'm ho- guys, I hope I, I hope I am connecting the dots. I know it's doctrine, I know. I've been asked to say it again. The kingship of Israel can be traced back to David. They could easily. It all began, like David. Now, I know Saul was there before, but things didn't go well. So David. The priesthood of Israel could be traced back to Aaron and the tribe of Levi. Genesis 14 comes before that. So already, they, like, like God was saying something to us. He was like, he's introducing Jesus, but he's going, listen, let me, let me, start, let me start slow. Because I know my people. They're also slow. So let me start slow. Let, let me give you Melchizedek. Gosh, I wish I could say more. But don't worry, we'll get to it. We'll get to it. The point is this. Jesus is both eternal king and eternal priest. That's the point that the writer of Hebrews is making. Jesus is both eternal king and eternal priest. And it all came to him by the ruling word of God the Father. This is why the word matters. We spoke about it last week. We can't just simply page through this stuff and look for our favorite texts. What I call smash and grab. It's how we treat the word of God. It's like, I just, I, what do I, I just need that today. What about the context around it? No, 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 just, just that one verse. I can do all things through Christ who strengthens me. It's like, yeah, I don't, I don't, I, the way you're applying it, I don't think that's correct. All of this was declared, made known to us by the word of God. Jesus did not seek it. That's what he's saying here. Well, just as Paul says in Philippians 2, he says he did not consider equality with God something to be grasped, but made himself nothing, taking the very nature of a servant, being made in human likeness. This, this speaks of Jesus' humility in all of this. And in the same way that he was humble here, he was humble with this role of king and priest. He carried it differently than all the other kings and all the other priests. This is why, this is why he is our high priest. Yeah, amen. Jesus' priesthood is therefore far superior to that of Aaron. Aaron's was temporary. But Jesus is a priest like Melchizedek forever. Let's get into some practical things. Verse 7. During his earthly life, he offered prayers and appeals with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death. And he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was the son, he learned obedience from what he suffered. After he, w- he was perfected, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obey him. And he was declared by God a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. Yeah. He is our high priest, Amen. the high priest. Amen. And because of that, then verse 7 to verse 10 now makes sense. Yeah. It makes sense. We can respond rightly to it. Here we see not only the, the genuine humanity of Jesus, but also the reason why he was able to sympathize with those of us whom he serves as the high priest. The writer of Hebrews takes us to the Garden of Gethsemane, yeah. where he, 
being Jesus, offered prayers and appeals with loud cries and tears to the one who was able to save him from death. Jesus wrestled. Jesus struggled. Jesus cried out. Jesus cried with tears. He he knows the tension of, of, of living between suffering and obedience. He knows it. And he chose obedience every single time. Unlike us, he chose obedience. But it doesn't mean that he didn't cry out to God. It doesn't mean that he didn't struggle, that he didn't wrestle. He's able to sympathize with us. Jesus asked that the cup be taken away from him. Yet the cup was not. Regardless, his prayer was heard. His prayer was heard. And he was heard because of his reverence. His reverence. His, 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 his awe and wonder of who God is. Like he's in that moment of suffering, but he goes, you know what? I'm going to cry out to God. Because he alone, he alone deserves every single cry that I have. I think some of us, our, our, our dignity before men gets in the way of our worship to God. Now, I'm not saying that we shouldn't be dignified. We should. Please, please be dignified. Especially during question of the day, please. But I worry sometimes that our dignity before men gets in the way of our worship to God. Like, like, like you're wrestling, you're struggling, but you're, you're like, you know, no, I need to keep it together. Why? Be- because of those who are around me. They need to see me as composed and that I have everything in control, that my life is just perfect. Uh, but deep inside, you are wrestling. That's not what it says Jesus did. He cried out loud, but he cried out to the Father. Yeah. Yeah. And so my first question to you is, what are you doing with everything that's happening in here? Some of you are ready to explode. The fact that you made it here today is a, is a miracle in of itself. And I praise God for that miracle. But now that you're here, listen, you cry out to God. And there's various ways that we do that here. We do it in song. That's what, like, when we sing, like, that, that last song got me. It got me. We, we, cannot let the, we cannot let the rocks. We, we simply cannot. And we cry out to the Father because He hears us. With reverence, the text tells us. That the reverence with, with awe and wonder, just going, you know what? I don't, I don't have it all together, but He does. I, I don't know what, what tomorrow holds for me, but He does. I don't know if I'm going to be able to provide, but He can. Like, do, do you get that? Right, right thoughts about God lead to the correct response to Him. And I think we don't have the right thoughts about Him. Sometimes we think of God as like, you know, like He's, he's just punishing us for everything. Like, how dare, how dare you doubt? Really? Br- bring your doubts to God. He's, he's, not, he's not afraid of your doubts. He's not. But, but because we, we need to pretend and perform, and it's like, you know what, no, 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 no. Like I said, I need to have it all together. You know what ends up happening? You just take your doubt somewhere else. And those things cannot give you what God can give you. I'm telling you now. We, we, we talk about faith, and, and we're going to get to it. We're going to get to faith. We're going to talk a lot about it, but let me give you the intro here. I spoke about it a couple of weeks ago, I think during Easter. There's, there's, there's varying degrees of faith here. My prayer for you is that your faith would increase, that your faith would grow, that you would have enormous faith. But you know what's more important than that? The object of your faith. So so even if you show up here with a little bit of faith, Jesus says it. Jesus says it. You show up here with a a little, like like you you just, you got out of bed and you're just like, 
I don't, I don't know. I don't, I, I don't, I don't. It's, it's, God, are you still, you know what? I believe, but help my unbelief. Yeah. That little bit of faith can move mountains. Yeah. It, 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 can, it can radically change environments. But do we believe? Do we believe? And he was heard because of his reverence. Although he was the son, he learned obedience from what he suffered. Jesus learned obedience. Think about that for a moment. Like often I go, he 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 just had it. Kind of an unfair advantage. You know, came out the womb and just, just but, but no, he, he, he learned, you know what I pray for my kids? That they would grow in wisdom and stature. Yeah. Favor with people and favor with God. Mm-hmm. Why? Because, because Jesus grew in wisdom and stature. He, he, he grew. He, he learned obedience. As a child, he obeyed his parents. As an adult, he obeyed the law. He fulfilled all righteousness. All his life, Jesus completely fulfilled the Father's will. He he knew what obedience was prior to his incarnation, of course, but he learned it. He learned obedience while here on earth, experiencing every situation that we go through. He kept his eyes on the Father. And so if Jesus learned obedience, friends, so can we. Yeah. So can we. Yeah. And so now my question to you is, how are you doing? How are you doing? How, like, I said it last week, how, how do we learn obedience? Here. Are you even reading this? And, 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 and I know, I, I don't say it like, like one who's just trying to, you know, I've got a whip and I'm just trying, no, I'm, I'm speaking to myself. When I am not obedient, when I'm doing my own things, it's because I've turned away from the word of God. And now my eyes are searching for something else. And yet Jesus kept his eyes on the Father. What we do matters. Again, we're going we're gonna to get into that. Like I said, this is the introduction to the dissertation. But, but what we do matters. I keep going to James because I, like, I love James. Like, James is my guy. Faith without works is dead. That's, that's me. You know, I'm, I'm like, the king said it, so go do it. Like, it's like parenting with my kids. I think we're now a generation, and, and, and I know, you know, like, they, they need to have a voice, and they need to tell us what they feel. Like, I totally get it. I'm all in. I'm, I, I love my kids, and, I, and that's how we parent. We're great parents. But sometimes I'll tell my kids no, and then they'll go, why? Because I said no. You, you have to trust me as your father that my no is for your good. Yeah. Yeah. Learning obedience. And I think sometimes when the reverence is gone, we're like, but why? Why, God? Go make this up. Why? Get plugged into God. Why? Is it because that we don't believe that he is good? We are loved more than we could ever imagine. And, and whenever we doubt that, we look to the finished work of Christ. That's why we learn obedience. It matters. It, it. Exodus. This is super interesting. Exodus. God tells Moses to go to Pharaoh to tell him to let his people go. We, we connect that to salvation. Right? They were in bondage, and now... Salvation, they're going to the promise that they've been released, they've been free, salvation. When does God give the people the law? Exodus 19, Exodus 20. So for like 20 chapters, there is, there is, there is no law. I'm not saying, the, the, the law, it matters. But salvation... Salvation. And, and even in that, there were, like, before the law, there was grumbling. There was complaining. So it's not, it's not it's, we can't just say, like, oh, you know, it's because of the law, you know, it's because of God's word. That, uh, no, 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 no. Long before they were given that, they were already, 
right thoughts about who God is. Right thoughts about who God is. It matters. After he was perfected, he became the source of eternal salvation for all who obeyed him. See, this salvation is extended to all who obey him. The first step of obedience is to surrender your life to Jesus as Lord and Savior. Yeah. It's to say, I can't, I, I can't save myself. Good. I can't. Just like we, we were dead. We were dead. Like Lazarus, dead. Dead. We smell. You can do absolutely nothing as a dead person. Save me. That's the first step of obedience. In this sense, all who obey him is used to describe those who believe in him. And those who believe in him will desire to obey him. So, so, and I know we're all imperfect human beings. I'm the worst sinner here in the room. I'll go ahead and tell you. But if there's, if you go for an extended period of time and there's zero, zero desire to obey, you know, what? you know what our response to you should be? You need to surrender your life to Jesus. You, you may not be a Christian. And it's weird to say that in a room like this. I, I was talking to, to the elders this last week. I'm like, like, doing ministry in our context, it's strange. You, you want to know why like, I, I don't go, and I'm, there's nothing wrong with like, raise your hand if you want to give your life to Jesus. There's nothing wrong with that. I'm all for it. But you want to know why I don't do it? Because many of us in this room probably wouldn't, like, we're just like, no, I've, I've been around Christian stuff. I've, I've grown up in the church. I'm, like, so many of us, we, we, we assume that we are Christian. Yeah. Sure. Because of our environment. Sure. Sure. But the question is, have you, yeah. not your parents, not your church, not your pastor, have you surrendered your life to Jesus? Verse 10, band, you guys can come up. And he was declared by God a high priest according to the order of Melchizedek. There he is again. Hebrews chapter 7 verse 23 to 28 gives us a clear interpretation of not just verse 10, but basically everything that we've literally just walked through. Some of you are going, oh, Nathan, why did you have to talk so long? Why don't you just read Hebrews 7 verse 23 to 28? But... I don't know. <laughs> I figured we all showed up here. You guys are just really, really nice. Let, let, me, let me give you 40 minutes of God's word. But, but here's what it says. And again, we're going to get to it. But I just want to give it to you now. There's no... It says this, verse 23 of chapter 7. There were many priests under the old system, for death prevented them from remaining in office. But because Jesus lives forever, his priesthood lasts forever. Therefore, he is able once and forever to save those who come to God through him. He lives forever to intercede with God on their behalf. He is the kind of high priest we need because he is holy and blameless, unstained by sin. He has been set apart from sinners and has been given the highest place of honor in heaven. Unlike those other high priests, he does not need to offer sacrifices every day. They th did this for their own sins first and then for the sins of the people. But Jesus did this once for all when he offered himself as a sacrifice for the people's sins. The law, the law, the law appointed high priests who were limited by human weakness. But after the law was given, God appointed his son with an oath. And his son has been made the perfect high priest forever. And so as we make our way through the book of Hebrews, we need to see Jesus as the perfect high priest forever. And so if all of this is true, if all of this is true, how then are we to respond? 
I'm glad you asked. Hebrews chapter 4, verse 14 to 16. Therefore, since we have a great high priest who has passed through the heavens, Jesus, the Son of God, let us hold fast to our confession. For we do not have a high priest who is unable to sympathize with our weaknesses, but one who has been tempted in every way as we are yet without sin. And then hear this, friends. Therefore, let us approach the throne of grace with boldness. With boldness. You know, for some of us, boldness is limping to the throne of grace. The world will tell us that that's weakness. But if I'm heading to the throne of grace, it doesn't matter how I show up there. If I need like two or three people to help me to the throne of, that's boldness. Boldness is saying, guys, I need help. But boldness is looking to the heavens and going, you know what, I can't. I'm not in control of my own life. You are, I need you. That's boldness. Boldness is a tiny little bit of faith. That's boldness. Because that tiny little bit of faith can restore your marriage. That tiny little bit of faith can bring back the prodigal son or daughter. That tiny little bit of faith can provide for you. That tiny little bit of faith can remove that addiction. That tiny little bit of faith with boldness. So that we may receive mercy and find grace to help us in a time of need. And so in a moment, I'm going to pray, and then we're going to stand, and then we're going to respond in song. We're going to sing a favorite hymn of mine. It's called, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. This was written in the 18th century by a man called Robert Robinson, and he wrote it at the age of 22. 22. I'd love to get into his story, but this, he was a wild man in a gang causing chaos, so much chaos that he found himself in a church gathering, not because he wanted God, but because he wanted to cause chaos there. He sits down, listens to the preaching of a man called George Whitfield. The Holy Spirit takes a hold of his heart. He surrenders his life to Jesus, radically transformed. And so this tells us that the worst person that you are thinking of, Jesus can save. And not just save, but do big things with them. Don't count yourself out. And so he grows in his faith, and then he, he, he pens this, this hymn. Come thou fount of every blessing. Tune my heart to sing thy grace. Streams of mercy never ceasing. Calls of songs of loudest praise, of loudest praise. Teach me some melodious sonnet sung by flaming tongues above. Praise the mount, I'm fixed upon it, mount of thy redeeming love. T towards the end of this hymn, he writes, prone to wonder, Lord, I feel it. Prone to leave the God I love. Here's my heart, go take and seal it. Seal it for thy courts above. <laughs> the, the, the story, the, the, the story of, of, of Robert Robinson is it, it, like sometimes we think, oh, it's just, it was just smooth sailing for him. No, 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 no. He wandered from God. He wandered from God. And I've, I doesn't go into detail why. I don't know if he like took his eyes off the word of God or he, he, he got in a group of like some really shady, I don't know, shady people. I don't know, I don't know. But he wandered from God and then found himself on a train one day. And sitting opposite him was a lady who wouldn't stop talking. And she says to him, I love Jesus. I love Jesus, and, 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 and one of the hymns that I love is this, is this hymn called, Come Thou Fount of Every Blessing. Unaware that it's him who wrote it. He eventually looks at her and he says, you know what? 
I have wandered from God. I have wandered from God. And then her response to him was the streams of mercy are still flowing. The streams of mercy that you wrote about, that you experienced, are still flowing. And so if that's you this morning, I want you to know that the streams of mercy are still flowing because we have a high priest who continually intercedes for us. He knows you by name. He knows you by circumstance, by situation. He knows everything that you are going through. He gets you. And so he can sympathize with you. Let us hold fast to our confession. And so, Father God, I pray for every single person here. I pray that we, we would find ourselves at the foot of the cross, that, 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 that we would boldly approach the throne of grace, that we would come to you. Our Father who is seated on his throne, fully in control. And Jesus, you are seated at the right hand of our Father. You pray for us by name. And I could go through this room and just list names and names. What many of us need is we need to hear our name from your mouth. To remind us that you have not forgotten us. That you have not left us that you are with us every step that we take. And so God, I pray, I pray for those who are hurting, for those who are struggling, for those who are wrestling. God, would you meet them where they are? Because your mercy still flows. I pray for those who have not made a decision to surrender their lives to you as Lord and Savior. I pray now in this moment, Holy Spirit, would you take a hold of their hearts? Would the dignity of men not get in the way of our worship of you? We are loved more than we could ever imagine. In Jesus' beautiful name we pray. Amen.